Hello, everyone. Good morning. Okay, so I hope you all had a good um, CNY break last week. Okay. Um, yeah, so last week, the lab, I think uh, uh, so far, I, the TAs didn't uh, point out anything major. So I believe everything went smoothly. All right. So as long as you have seen that uh, lecture, all right, then uh, I think you should have been able to do the lab, all right, which is basically the interrupt. All right. I will also be doing a bit of a demo later, okay, uh, together with uh, this week's uh, lab as well. Okay, uh, so today we're going to cover quite a few things. So my target is by the first half of lecture to finish up the timers lecture and um, go through the demo. And we will go for a break and we'll come back and we'll start on the communication lecture. All right, uh, so we most likely can't finish that, but we'll finish up next week uh, so that uh, you can be prepared for the next week's demo uh, lab as well. All right, and for next week onwards, uh, I mean, I'll be sure later, we also need to start developing the app or the web interface, all right, and uh, start to um, put things together. So from next week onwards, uh, basically you already have a full complete system, all right, uh, to control all the hardware that you need, all right, and from then on will be just the OS part, okay? Um, so let me get started. Okay, so I just saw this. Uh, what happened to the screen? Give me a minute. Okay, so I just saw this post that day. I found it quite funny. All right, this is why every Zoom call always starts with these two lines. Okay, so I'm trying to not say those two lines and just carry on, assuming that you all can see my screen. Okay, um, so this um, chapter is on the timer peripherals. Okay, so we have used uh, timers before uh, in your EPP1, EPP2, where we did the uh, PWM module. All right, uh, as well as some timer interrupts. So a similar concept, but we're just going to run through the, the main part, which is the uh, configuration and how it works on this particular controller board here. All right, so in terms of the timer block, uh, basically what we have is, uh, in terms of a, a general idea, you can say that it is a counter, all right, uh, that will count whenever it receives a clock. Okay, so there are two types of uh, triggers. One is a periodic clock, or the other is events. A periodic clock is used when you are using the internal clock or an external clock to just keep the counter running at a, a fixed interval. The other one is for events, all right? Uh, events are generally used when you want to count uh, uh, or you want to keep track of certain activity that is going on external to the controller. Okay, uh, uh, a good example would be your uh, a wheel encoder, right? So if let's say you, your, uh, your wheels have some encoder pulses coming out and you want to keep track of uh, the rotation, then you can use those uh, pulses, okay, to trigger the uh, counter and, and keep track of it. Okay, at the same time, uh, you can also have some uh, pre-scaling, okay, that is done to generate uh, other signals like PWM signals or other type of waveforms. And you also have interact capability. Okay, so this is just a general idea uh, that most timer or counter blocks uh, have these kind of features. All right, so whether it's this particular controller and this board or the Arduino boards or some other boards in the future, generally this is what you uh, expect from a counter module. So for the KL25Z, okay, one of the simple mode of operation of a timer is what we call the PIT or the periodic interrupt timer. So in this uh, periodic interrupt timer is uh, basically what you do is you write uh, a value, okay, to a register, which is the timer start value. And once you write a value to the register, it just automatically starts counting down. Okay, so you just keep counting down until it hits zero. Okay, once it hits zero, it will automatically reset to the same starting value 
and trigger a interrupt. And this will just keep on happening. All right, so as long as the timer is running, okay, you can just uh, load it with any particular value, all right, which you can also change at any time. So for example, here you started off at 1000, then you can change it to 700. All right, and every time it counts down to zero and it overflows back to the top, then you just generate an interrupt. Okay, so this is a very easy way of generating periodic interrupts in your system. All right, so if I know that this particular LED is always going to blink at a rate of one second or five seconds. Okay, so I can just set up a periodic interrupt timer, okay, that just uh, counts down based on that interval and just keeps toggling the LED. All right, so this is one easy way of uh, generating periodic interrupts. All right, so that one is very straightforward. Now what we're going to more, be more focused on is the timer PWM module. All right, which we need to use because of the motor control that we want to achieve. Okay, so uh, before we get onto that, uh, let me just do a quick poll to see if you uh, remember what you did in the last lab or you were busy with iPower, okay, while your friend was doing it. All right, so this is um, based on the configuration, okay, which is a similar thing you did in the last week's lab. So you want to configure the IRQ priority level for port D, okay, at a value two. Oh, wait, uh, sorry, the poll is locked. Yeah, give me a minute. Uh, why is the poll locked? Ah, okay, sorry. Uh, let me run that again. And now you should be able to see the link. Yeah. So it's always the same same link, polleb.com slash rsnus. Okay, so this is actually one of the midterm questions. Uh, I think last or last last year. Okay, so which uh, answer do you think is correct? Okay, so you answer based on your understanding. Don't worry about the majority. Okay, not necessarily that the majority is always right. Okay, so just answer based on what you think is the correct answer. Okay, so some of you have replied. Um, again, some are still, I think, on the sidelines waiting for the answer. All right, so let me uh, discuss this. So basically, uh, let's let's look at it and understand. So the IPR7 register, so if you look back at the uh, lecture slides, okay, you will see that we have a total of these eight IPR registers. All right, and each of them, uh, is to configure four different interrupts, all right? And these interrupt numbers are obtained, okay, from the uh, data sheet. Okay, so if you go to your um, KL25Z, uh, sorry, the Cortex-M0 microcontrollers uh, data sheet, all right, uh, you can see the uh, vectors over here. Okay, the vector number. So what you are interested in is the interrupt uh, IRQ number over here. Okay, so it's starting from zero all the way to 31. And 31 is the one that is mapped to port D. Okay, 31 is mapped to port D. So that is the uh, bits we want to configure. All right, so that is the first thing. We must know 
where uh, the particular peripheral that you want to configure is mapped to what is the IRQ number. Okay, so we know it is IRQ 31. Okay, so it's, if it's IRQ 31, we are interested in this, these bits. Okay, and for each of this, we have two bits, correct? Right? So even though this is eight bits, eight bits, and so on, we only use the upper two bits. All right, so we only use the upper two bits to determine the priority. And this upper two bits can have four combinations, correct? Right? One, zero, and one, one. So this will be priority zero, one, two, and three. So if I want a priority level of two, which is this, that means the most significant bit must be one and everything else will be zero. All right, so basically what I need is a one shifted to the left by 31. All right, that will give me the priority level of two. Okay, so that is why the correct answer, okay, so the majority is correct in this case. Okay, so the answer is this, the second option here, one shifted left by 31. All right, so again, this is just to quickly recap something that we did or the, that you all did in the last uh, interrupt lab. All right, so it's always important, okay, you, you know how to relate to that table and go back to that, I mean, the vector table as well as the table of the IPR register. So you know which IPR register to access for any particular interrupt that you want to configure. All right, so now uh, we continue with the timer PWM module. All right, so for the KL25Z, okay, we have a total of three timers. Okay, uh, timer zero, timer one, and timer two. Okay, three timers, and each of them have has a total of uh, six channels. Okay, so channel zero all the way to channel five. So total of six channels, all right, which is a lot of PWM. That means it's six times three, 18 PWM. Okay, you only need two PWM. Uh, or up to you, whether you want two wheel drive or four wheel drive. Okay, that's up to you. So either you either need two PWM or four PWM at most. All right, so a single timer is enough for you to uh, control the uh, the robot that we have. All right, uh, so for this um, timer, let's explore how it works and what are the, the modes of operation. So the first thing is the configuration. All right, so the first thing is uh, whether we want internal or external clock. So as what I mentioned just now, uh, the internal is when you want to keep it at a periodic rate. External is usually when you have uh, some other external clock or an external event. Okay, in our case, since we are using it for PWM generation, all right, we're going to uh, use it for the, uh, we're going to use the internal clock. Okay, the next is the pre-scaler. So this is also quite a standard, uh, sort of uh, future you have. And these are all the options available. All right, so we can of course choose any number we want depending on what frequency we want to, to operate at. Okay, so if you're hearing some, uh, some background noise, there's some uh, renovation work going up, uh, going on on the upper unit, okay? Uh, okay, so as a question, when do we use the external clock? So the external clock is used if, uh, usually the case is when uh, the none of the prescaler with the internal clock settings meet your particular requirement. Okay, so if you are running at a particular frequency, okay, a clock. Okay, so our default clock is 20 point something uh, megahertz. Okay, then of course you can, uh, push it up to 48 megahertz and so on, all right? But let's say you, you try all the different combinations of clock and you want some particular N uh, hertz, okay? And you can't get it, all right? No matter what combination you use, then you may use an external clock, all right? So this is, of course, uh, usually we, we 
we try to do with what we have internally to minimize any external uh, hardware. All right. Uh, so in the lab uh, demo later, I will show you uh, an example using the one to eight, and of course you can change it around depending on what you want. Okay, in terms of uh, counting, the timer can go up or up and down. All right, which we will see later. And then there is a mod value. So the mod value is usually the sort of the top, top value from which the counter will either overflow or will count down. All right, so it's either the count up mode means you count up and then reset, count up and reset and so on. In up down counting, you count up, then count down, count up and count down. All right, so it's uh, two different modes of operation. And, uh, and as you will see later, you can configure interrupts, you can configure PWM and so on, depending on which mode of operation you want to use. All right, uh, these are of course additional things like DMA that also can be uh, activated on overflow and so on. All right, so there are many things that you can link together. All right, that means when the timer uh, overflows, what should happen? All right, uh, so in our use case scenario, is basically when the timer hits, that particular mode of operation and it overflows, then we generate the appropriate PWM signal. Okay, in the basic counter mode is uh, again, when I want to count external events like the encoder pulses or maybe some sensor, you want to keep track of how many people going in and out of a room, then you fix a sensor at the, the doorway, correct? And then every time the IR sensor beam breaks, Okay, it generates a pulse. All right, so this is easy way to do a, a count. All right, so you want to keep track of how many pulses you receive. So that is what you call external events. And you can configure it in the, in the basic counter mode. All right, so that is again a different use case, uh, but we, we're not going to use that in our case. In terms of counting, all right, you can go, like I said, count up. Or count out, count down. If I use the counting up mode, all right, what happens is you start from zero and you count up to the mod value. So in this case, the mod value is uh, four. So you count all the way to four. All right. And then at the end of the fourth clock, you will, you will do a reset. Okay. And it will set the overflow flat bit. And then you will start again. All right, so this overflow flag bit uh, is basically the flag that indicates that this particular event has happened, okay? And whether you want interrupts or not is up to you, okay? Um, so this applies to almost all peripherals, okay? Even if the, the interrupt, uh, INT, the, the push button interrupt, uh, when we configure it, all right, we can always configure it such that when a particular event happens, I set the flag and that is automatic. The hardware does it. But whether I want to interrupt is whether the interrupt is enabled. All right, so if the interrupt is enabled and the flag is set, then you jump to the interrupt service. So it's always like an end gate. For almost every peripheral, it's always an interrupt enable and interrupt flag. Okay, so in some cases, you want the flag to be set to indicate that the event has happened, but you do not want to interrupt. Okay, so that could be just the way you want the system to behave. All right, then I just want to know that this event happened, but I don't need to immediately react to it. I can handle it later on. So I don't need to interrupt. All right, so in those kinds of situations, you may not want to enable the interrupt, but you just capture the flag. And then you use that flag to do something else later on. All right, so that is the count up uh, operation. In terms of count up and count down, it is. Uh, you, you do the same thing, you start from a uh, value zero. In this case, mod is four. So once I hit uh, the highest value, the mod value, at the next clock, I will set, uh, I will count down, okay? And that instance where I count down is where the overflow flag bit is set, okay? So in this case, you can see uh, that the overflow flag bit is set here. All right, and then if you do not clear the flag manually, if you do not clear the flag in your code, then the flag will continue to be remain set. 
Okay, so that is how most interrupts work. Okay, when the flag is activated, okay, it is up to the, uh, I mean, in most cases, the software or the interrupt service should, should clear the flag. Okay, there could be some uh, particular uh, peripherals which automatically clear the flag the moment you jump to the service routine and so on. Okay, so again, this uh, not set in stone. Okay, so it depends on the, the hardware and architecture you're dealing with. All right, so in, in some situations, all right, the flag will be set until you manually clear it in the software or the interrupt service routine. In some cases, the flag may automatically be cleared if the interrupt service routine is activated. All right, so in this situation, you need to manually clear it. All right, so the flag just continues to be remain set. Okay, so again, the, these are just two different modes of operation depending on what you want to, uh, or which one you want to use. Uh, so the flags are all captured in this status register over here. All right, so in our case, we do not need to manually check these flags. Okay, why? Because if we are using interrupts, we enable interrupts, but in our case, we are not using interrupts. All right, our timer module, okay, is going to be used in a way that it just generates the PWM. Okay, we're not going to manually use interrupts to do anything. All right, so maybe to, to, to just uh, highlight what I'm saying there. All right, uh, let me go back to this slide here. All right, so if you look at this slide over here, this picture, All right, so this is basically what we talked about. So first we select the mode of operation, we select the pre-scaler, all right? And then once we select the pre-scaler, what will happen? Your counter will start counting, okay? Depending on whether it's going to count up, count down, and so on. Now, when the counter is counting, you can see that there are two different pathways. One is the counter value goes this way, and the counter value goes this way. All right, so what we did so far is this. Okay, we are looking at it from this perspective where uh, the counter overflows. Okay, it count until a particular value, then it overflows. Then depending on whether the interrupt is enabled or not, the interrupt is activated. Okay, so this is used when? This is used when, like I mentioned, uh, you want to do something at a particular periodic interval. Okay, every five milliseconds, I want to do this every, 10 milliseconds, I want to do something else, and so on. So you can configure all these registers to generate interrupt service routine, or to generate interrupt, and then when the, you go to the interrupt service routine, you perform these activities. Now, at the same time, while all this is happening, there is another set of hardware over here. So these are what we call the channels, the six channels that I mentioned just now. And these six channels are a separate hardware that can be used to do other things at the same time using the same configuration of the timer. All right, and these are not tied to this interrupt over here. Okay, so if I want the interrupt, okay, I can enable it and it will work. But in our case, we don't need to use that because what we want is we want to generate a PWM signal on the output pin. All right, so that is a separate hardware that is also running in parallel okay, on the same timer block. Okay, so that is what we're going to be looking at now. Okay, which is this. Uh, yeah, ah, yeah. So the, 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 the six channels that we talked about, okay, the channel mode, there are three types of channel modes. The input compare, uh, so input capture, output compare, and PWM. Okay, so I'm going to focus on this. Okay, these two modes of operation, input capture, output compare, are uh, again useful if you want to measure some pulse or you want to generate some particular pulse, okay, with the width and so on. So if you're interested, you can read the data sheet and, and use this if you want, okay, for any particular application. Uh, I'm going to focus on the PWM part, all right, which is basically to control the motors. And to select the mode of operation, there are two registers. The first register is this TPM CNSC register, where you need to set these four bits correctly. 
okay, which we will look at later in the data sheet. And the other register is the CNV register, okay, which is the basically the value for the compare. All right, so PWM, I think uh, you all know uh, right now, is basically a way to generate an uh, equivalent analog signal. So if the duty cycle is low, then the equivalent analog. So if let's say this is 3.6 volt and this is 0 volt, okay, then this could be maybe 0 0.9 volt. Okay, so it's 50% means it will be 1.8 volt. Okay, it's 90% means, okay, it's close to the full value. So maybe it's about, you know, 3.3 .3 volt or something. Okay, so a PWM is just basically a way to uh, generate an equivalent analog voltage from pulses. Okay, so that is the whole idea. So you have the pulse width, the period. So these are two main things that you want to control to get the desired PWM signal. So the first thing is the period. The period is controlled through the mod value that you put in okay so the mod value the mod plus one uh, here will determine how long is it does it take for one periodic waveform to be generated okay so that is the period now the pulse width which is from here to here that is based on the cnv value all right the cnv value is basically a value in the register that we will write so if i were to draw out the sequence basically what is happening is okay so again it depends on whether you use uh, edge align or uh, center align so if i use edge align we know that the value that we have will count up okay all the way till we reach the mod value and then it will reset and then next again all right, now this pulse width is a CNV value. That means it is the value that I write into some register. So for example, if the CNV value, okay, so it is somewhere here. Okay, the value is somewhere here. So what will happen is this is the point where you will trigger the match. Okay, and depending on these two bits that we will set, you either get a pulse like this, Okay, or the other way around. Okay, so when it's high, true pulses means when it's counting up, it is high. Okay, so the moment the match occurs, it will do a transition to the low. Okay, and again, when it starts to count up again, that means from zero is counting up again, it will go back to high. And the next match, it will go to low. So this CNV value basically determines my uh, pulse width, okay, which will uh, again relate to my duty cycle. Okay, so that is how you relate the mod value and the CNV value together. The same thing applies for the uh, in the center aligned PWM. So in the center aligned PWM, again the same thing. Okay, so you have your main waveform that goes up and down. Okay, goes up and down, and this is your mod value. All right, and your CNV value is basically the, the, the value that you will use to check whether it's a match. So all those instances where it matches, you will trigger the change. So in this case, the output that you generate can be looking like this. Okay, or the other way. So either this way or the other way, depending on the high true pulses or low true pulses. All right, so in the uh, lab demo, okay, that you're going to be doing, or the lab you're going to be doing this uh, Friday, you're going to, I'm going to show you the demo in a while. Okay, so we are using the uh, edge align, all right, uh, PWM mode, all right, and you're going to see how it works based on that. Okay, so let's, uh, look at that uh, lab demo now all right so that you understand how it works okay and before that uh, let me just show you the led strip so uh, in the bag that you were given okay in the bag that you were given uh, each of you had an led strip uh, 
So let me show you the LED strip here. Okay, so this is basically the LED strip that you have. All right. Um, so the the you can just try and and see which side is anode, which side is cathode. All right. And what it has is basically is, it is a list of LEDs already packed together nicely. Okay. So what I've shown here is basically these LEDs running in sequence. We're using the LED strip. Okay. So you can use this if you want. Uh, for your project, or if you want to use the standalone LEDs and just uh, connect them up, it's also fine. All right, so this is just an additional piece of hardware that you can choose to use. Okay, so in my circuit here, you can see that I also sort of taken some shortcut in a sense that instead of using a single resistor for each of the cathode, I connected up all the cathodes together and use a single resistor. Okay, and again, since I'm only going to light up one LED at a time, it's fine. All right, only one of the LEDs will bias through the resistor. Okay, so it does not affect the brightness of the LEDs in any way. All right, so this is just one additional hardware, again, for you to use as an option. If you don't want to use it, it's fine. Okay, you don't need to use it. Okay, so let me uh, set up the demo here and I will show you. Um, give me a minute. Okay, so let's uh, open up the Okay, so now the first thing is, uh, which are the channels or which are the uh, pins that we're going to use? Okay, so let's look at the data sheet, okay, to have a, a better idea of this. Okay, so if you look back at your data sheet, okay, if you look at the timer uh, module, okay, so Okay, so you can see that there are three sets of registers. Okay, TPM uh, zero, okay, TPM zero, okay, TPM one and TPM two. So for each of these uh, uh, timer modules, we have the same set of registers. Okay, the SC register, counter register, mod register, and so on. Okay, so for the lab, again, this week's lab, okay, we are going to. Okay, we're going to use timer one, okay, channel zero and channel one. Okay, so that's why if you look in your lab manual, okay, we have configured uh, using both port B pin zero and port B pin one. Okay, so this is of course coming back to the mapping on the, uh, on the multiplexing on the uh, board that we have. So let's look at the multiplexing to understand why we use port B pin zero and pin one. Okay, so if you come here to look at uh, port B pin zero and port B pin one, okay, you can see that the alternate three function is TPM one channel zero and TPM one channel one. Okay, so you have, you have options. Right? You have options. I'm just showing you one possible way of using these timers. Okay, you can always use other uh, timers as well. Okay, other channels as well. All right, when you are building a project. All right, so as long as you come back to this table to know 
which pins they are mapped to, okay, and what is the alternate function, okay, then you, you want to make sure you code it in the correct way, okay, then you can use that particular channel. Okay, so in this case, I'm going to use port B pin 0 and pin 1, which is mapped to TPM1, that means timer module 1, channel 0, and channel 1. Okay, so that's the first thing over here. So timer port B0, timer 1, and as a timer 1, channel 0, and channel 1. Okay, so let's look at the init PWM code over here. All right, so the first thing is uh, we enable the clock gating. Okay, so this is standard. All right, whenever you use any particular port, you have to enable the clock gating for that. All right, so when you use port B, port D, port C, you go to the, uh, all the ports are mapped to the SCGC file register. Okay, and you already used this in the last two laps. Okay, so you know uh, that this is important. Now, the next thing is you want to configure the multiplexing. Okay, so in this case, port B pin 0 and port B pin 1, you want to use multiplexing and the alternate function is alternate 3. Okay, again, from here. Okay, it's alternate 3 is the timer mode. Okay, so that is why we need to configure the alternate uh, moxic option as 3. Okay, next, you also need to enable the clock gating for the timer module. Okay, so this is important huh? because even though we enable clock gating for port B, okay, we also still need to enable clock gating for the peripheral that is currently mapped to the port B. Okay, so since we want to use timer one on port B, we also need to enable the clock gating for timer one. Okay, so that is um, in SCGC six register. Okay, so let me just do a search here. Okay, so under SCGC six register, you can see that the timers are mapped here. Okay, so DPM 0, 1, and 2. Okay, so since I'm using the built-in macro, it just automatically goes to the correct bit to enable it. All right, so I mean, the, the, like, like I said before, the header files all right, already has all the macros that define all the bits, all the registers, everything for us very nicely. All right, so we can sort of leverage that to um, uh, make our coding a bit easier. Okay, so yeah, so line seven is SCGC five, but SCGC five is for the port B, and SCGC six is for the TPM. All right, so you need to enable clock gating for both port B because we are currently using the port B uh, multiplex option. And since we are using the particular multiplex uh, uh, timer module, we also need to enable the TPM mask for the uh, SCDC 6. Okay, so if you look at this definition here, okay, so this SIM SCGC phi is the same, okay, uh, as this using the SIM and pointing to SCGC six. Okay, so they are both they both work in the same way. Okay, so you can use either way to uh, sort of uh, access the SCGC register. Both are equivalent. Okay, both work the same way. All right, so inside the header file, you will have a lot of different definitions where all these registers are mapped to. So as long as you use one of the correct definitions, it's fine. Okay, now let's go on to the actual timer module. All right, so let's look at this option first. Select clock. All right, so this one is to select the clock for the timer module. Okay, so this is the first step that we talked about just now. Okay, so let me go back here to the slides. 
Okay, so the first thing that we say is we want to select the internal clock. Okay, so how do we select the internal clock? All right, so in this uh, controller, all right, what we need to do is we need to go to this register called the SOPT2. Okay, SIM SOPT2. All right, so let me show you where that is. Yeah. So this is the SIM SOPT2 register, which where you need to configure these bits here, TPM, SRC, TPM source. Now, if you look at this, uh, this is to select the clock that you want, all right? Now, there are four different options here, and the one that points to the internal uh, built-in clock is this zero one over here. Okay, so of course, uh, you, you probably need to read the rest of the, the data sheet to figure out why it is this particular option, but. For now, you can just take it that this zero one option here is the one that maps to the internal clock. Okay, that means whatever clock setting that you are going to configure your board in, this zero one option will use that particular clock. Okay, so that is the first option here. So the, the style of programming is the same. We first clear the bits, okay, using the and and the complement, and then we all it. Okay, so in this case, we are using the built-in macro. So when I say TPSRC is one, all right, that means it will set it to the zero one value. All right, which will select the internal clock. All right, so that is the first thing. All right, so for this, this option, you can just take it as, as what I say that this will select the internal clock. Now, what is the internal clock? So that is coming back to the uh, setting in the uh, uh, system file. Okay, so we already did the clock setup change before. All right, so in this example, what I've done is I have changed the clock setup to one. Okay, I've defined it as one. So my default system clock is 48 megahertz. Okay, so this is uh, my setting over here. All right, just to uh, to show you that we, we don't need to stick with the default clock. Okay, so the default clock is clock setup zero. All right, uh, in my case, I just changed it to the uh, clock setup one, which is 48 megahertz. All right, so with that setting, all right, uh, this mod value, I will come back to this in a while. Okay, so if you remember what is the mod value, the mod value is the one that determines the period. Okay, the mod value is the one that determines the uh, period over here. Okay, so I'll count up to mod and then I'll re reset back. Count up to mod and reset back. So, okay, so the mod is the one that determines the period of the PWM waveform. All right, so now the next one is for the edge align PWM. What do I need to configure? All right, so just now in the slides, we mentioned that you need to configure four particular bits, which are the MS, uh, B and A, and ELS, B and A. All right, so these are the four bits that we need to configure to uh, make sure that it is the edge aligned PWM. Okay, but at the same time, you want to select it with the with that is uh, going to operate in PWM mode with the correct prescalar value. So let's do that first, and that is inside the SC register. Okay, so let me show you where that is. All right, so of course right now you may see that is like so many different registers, and you know. Uh, how do we make sense? All right, when you do the lab, all right, then uh, you can go through these slides again to sort of make sense of the various registers that you are dealing with. Okay, so let me show you the SC register. So in this SC register is where we configure the prescaler and C mod. Okay, so again, let me go back to the slide huh, so you can relate back to the slide. So this prescaler and C mod is what we did just now as well. Okay, so if you remember, we said that we need to first 
to the uh, CMOD, which is selecting uh, the uh, clock, then the free scalar value. All right. And then we can do the next step. So here, what we are doing is we are changing the CMOD value and the mass. Okay, so the CMOD and mass, what does it relate to? Okay, so in this, you can see that the CMOD and the PS. So let's look over here. So the PS is the prescaler. So in this example, I'm going to use a prescale value of 1 to 8. Okay, so I'm going to write three bits here, 1, 1, 1 to divide 1 to 8. Okay, so again, I'm just telling you all these are just random values that I just put in to demonstrate how this whole thing works. All right, later on when you are doing it, you can of course change it to whatever value, whatever frequency you want. Okay, now the other thing is the clock mode selection. All right, so even though we have selected uh, that is going to be using the internal clock, we also need to make sure that the clock is actually enabled to uh, count all right, while the internal clock is running at the same time. All right, so we need to set this C mod to 0, 1. Okay, so this 0, 1 is basically to say that now we have already configured to use internal clock. At the same time, we want to make sure that the counter, that means this particular timer module's counter is also going to be incrementing while the main clock is counting. All right, so that is the uh, two settings that we are doing for the SC register. All right, and then the last setting is the one that we said just now, which is the uh, ELSB and the MSB. Okay, so for that, let me just show you over here. All right, so that is under this register here called the CSC register. And since we want edge align PWM, I need to configure the MSB, MSA as 1, 0, and the ELSB and ELSA as 1, 0. Okay, so these are the two other sort of bits that we need to configure, which is what we are doing here. All right, so in this first line, we are clearing all the bits. Okay, we are clearing all the bits. So the B bit, A bit, B bit, A bit, okay, are all clear. And in this next line, I'm setting only the B bits for the ELSB and the B bits for the MSB. Okay, so the A bits are still zero because I already cleared it. Okay, so this matches the requirement here. So the B is one, the A is zero. Same thing here, B is one, A is zero. Okay, so we just want to follow the setting given in the data sheet over here. All right, so that basically wraps up all the configuration we need for the PWM. All right, and once all of that is done, okay, all you need to do is, okay, you need to uh, call the initialization function and write in a COV value. Okay, what is the CNV value? In this case, it's channel zero, so it's zero, C0V value. Now, this C0V value is what? It is the value that we will count up to to create a match okay so you can see here that the cnp value is the value that i'll count up to to get a match once there is a match is where it will go down and then wait for the next count up sequence then go up again okay so the cnp value will determine where the switching happens and the mod value determines the period Okay, so right now what I've done, okay, okay, so I forgot to go back to the earlier setting, which is the mod setting. So this mod value is 7,500. Okay, now, how do, why did I put 7,500? Because I want to get a frequency of 50 hertz. So how do I do all this calculation? So it comes back to the first setting. What is my main clock? Okay, so my main clock is 48 megahertz, all right, because I already updated my clock setup value to be one. So I'm going to use 48 megahertz. So that's the first thing. The next thing is my prescale value is one to eight. So from 48 megahertz, I divide by one to eight before I pass to my timer block. Okay, so the 48 megahertz divided by one to eight, that means my clock is now being clocked at a rate of uh, 375 
and kilohertz. All right. The next thing is I want to generate a 50 hertz waveform. Again, this is just a value that I chose to demonstrate only. So to generate a 50 hertz, that means what is the count I must count up to to bring uh, to make sure that I can generate 50 hertz. That means I need to have a mod value of 7,500. All right, so basically what is happening, that means every time I count up, so every time my timer module counts out to 7,500, I will switch, I will switch. So that determines the period of the overall waveform that I get. Okay, so that is why the mod value is 7,500. Okay, so that is the first thing. So depending on whatever frequency you want to generate, you must take the frequency of that which is clocking your, your module right now, divided by the mod value. Okay, that will give me the particular frequency that I want. All right, and the CMV register is basically the match. Okay, so in this case, what I've done is I've taken half of 7,500, which is 3,750, to put in my CMV value. All right, so basically what will happen is, Okay, so basically what happened is my timer module, okay, is going to count from zero all the way to 7,500 and then it will reset back. And my CNV value is 3,750. So it's 3,250. So every time it hits 3,250, it will create a match. Okay, which means that you will toggle, go down, and then you will come up again when it reset back. And again, the next match, you will go down and so on. Okay, so this will generate a 50% PWM for me. Okay, so let's uh, see that over here. All right, so of course, before that, we also need to map the correct pins. You need to know the correct pins. So since we are using port B, pin 0, and pin 1, so that is over here. Okay, so these are the two bits over here that we need to use. Port B, pin 0, and pin 1 for the connection. All right, so let's, let's see all of that now. Okay, so in terms of the hardware, Okay, so this is what we have. So this is the uh, port B pin zero, and this is the ground, okay, that I connected. Okay, so if I run this code now, So let me bring up the camera a bit. Okay, so you can see down here that we have a nice square waveform. And if I zoom in a bit, you can see the frequency there is 50 hertz. Okay, so that is basically the uh, signal coming out of channel uh, zero, or channel zero of timer module one. Okay, so let me connect up channel one as well. Okay, because we have, we have basically configured both of them. All right, so let me this. Okay, so the channel one is just beside channel zero. So channel zero is the bottom one here. Channel one is the one beside. Okay, then I got to connect up the ground together. Okay. So channel two doesn't seem to have anything. Okay, channel two doesn't seem to have anything. Only channel one is running. 
So why is channel two not having anything? Even though we have already configured everything. Can anybody tell me why only channel one I have a value? Again, because I have configured everything, all right, but the C and B value is not set. All right, we only set the C zero V value. Okay, so only the compare is happening for the channel zero, but the channel one is not happening. Okay, so uh, that's correct. Uh, okay, so there's another question whether the slides on luminous are slightly different. Okay, so the slides on luminous are, I think they have a few more extra slides, okay, which I went through again and I sort of removed some of them, which I felt was not really necessary. All right, so whatever that was not necessary, I just removed and updated here. Okay, so what I need to do is for channel one, I need to uncomment this. All right, so this is basically half of this. Okay, 753 is, uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, 0x753 is half of 0xEA6. All right, so basically now if I run it, you will see that channel one and channel two both will concurrently generate two different PWM. One is 50%, the other is 25%. Okay, so that, that's why they have that. Okay, so you can see that one of it is at 50%, the other is at 25%. Okay, but they are both running at the same time using the same timer one, all right, but two different channels, channel zero and channel one. Okay, so if you want to change the period, you change the mod value, you want to change the uh, duty cycle, you change the CFB value. All right, so that basically is sort of how the timer module is configured. All right, so for this uh, lab, uh, this Friday's lab, okay, so basically, I think I sort of went through all of this already to give you an idea of how or why we do all these configuration settings, all right? And what you need to do, okay? So uh, you don't need to do any lab demo uh, for this week. Okay, so you don't need to worry about the lab demo part. Okay, as long as you are able to see the waveform there, then you know it's correct, all right? Uh, so if you see it for yourself, it's fine. Unless you don't, do not see the signal coming out, okay, then you can yeah, ask the TA for some help to see figure out what went wrong. Okay, uh, the next thing is, uh, you can also use this PWM signal to generate uh, musical tones, which is also part of your project requirement. Okay, so you can generate different frequencies, all right, uh, again, I have already showed you how to do the calculations all right, for any particular frequency. All right, so you can use that to, to figure out how to have different frequencies and use that to um, play some musical tones on your buzzer. All right, so um, of course the buzzer that I've given to you is fairly low cost and it might not sound uh, as uh, pleasing to your ears. All right, if you want to buy a a uh, nicer speaker, you can do it. Okay, like I said, we have a $40 budget per team. All right, to buy whatever you need. All right, just make sure you keep the receipts. All right, to do the claim at the end. All right, so again, this is something for you to explore. All right, and, and uh, sort of figure out, okay, uh, while you are building up whatever musical tune that you want to play for the project. Okay, so yeah, so that basically is the whole timer module. All right, so the, again, timer module is not something new to you, but I think it's just the application of it in this particular context over here. All right, so as long as you get all the registers and all the configuration correct, then I think you should be able to see it working. Okay, and uh, yeah, you can play around with different timers, different frequency, different prescalers, all of that to see how the waveform looks like. And then from there, you can sort of set 
uh, some idea of how you want to do it. Okay, so um, I think we can go for a break now. Now it's 11. Uh, we'll go for about, uh, it's 11.03, like so we'll come back about 11.15. We come back at 15 and I will start the serial communication module just a bit uh, and brief you all a bit on the, uh, the user interface part for the project. Okay, so that you can also get started with that. Okay, so uh, let's go for a break. I'll see you all back here at 1115. Okay, if you have any questions, you can just put it in the chat first. Okay, once we are back, I will, I will address those questions. Okay, so I'll come back. Okay, so um, we'll continue with the lecture first for another 15 uh, or so minutes, and then I will brief you all a bit on the user interface design that you can start to prepare right, for the uh, uh, project. Okay, so let's uh, get started with this serial communication chapter. So serial communication, uh, again, there are three, there are a few different types, okay, that are generally seen in most controllers. The UART, SPI, and I2C. Um, yeah, I definitely would have liked to go through all of them in detail, but we don't have the time for that. All right, so we're going to uh, go through with UART first, all right, and we're going to use that for the project. Um, you know, uh, I'm planning to, of course, change it to SPI or I2C probably by the next batch of uh, this, this module is run. Okay, so uh, when I do that, I will send you all some updated slides. All right, so if you're interested to learn how to do the I2C or SPI communication on the board, all right, you can uh, look at those slides, okay, once I prepare them. All right, so in terms of uh, serial communication, basically, um, the whole idea is, uh, as we have already seen, a microcontroller has limited number of pins. All right? And with the chips getting smaller and smaller, there are, of course, very few pins available. All right? uh, of course, there are different kind of packages to extract more pins, uh, but still there is a, a shortage of physical pins available. All right? So that is where you have all the multiplexing going on. All right, but even with all the multiplexing, okay, if you were to talk about parallel communication in the past, all right, is highly inefficient. Correct? That means every peripheral device would need that number of bits. So if, let's say it's an 8-bit peripheral, then I need 8 bits just for the data alone. Okay, then you need other control signals, okay, to decide which way the direction or which way the data flows and so on. Okay. So it is not a practical solution, okay, uh, using uh, parallel means of communication. Okay, of course, in the past, before serial became popular, this was the way in which devices had to talk to each other. Okay, so if you ever uh, get a chance to see some very old, for example, a printer or whatever, uh, the, the cable that was used to connect to a printer was a very big, uh, thick cable with lots and lots of wires. Okay, connecting to one of your PCI cards on your computer, all right? Because that was the only way to communicate with such a device at the time. All right, uh, of course, now everything is serialized. So, of course, uh, another option was parallel buses, all right? Uh, which also were good because you only need one set of data lines, all right? Uh, so data was common, okay, across all the devices. Then you need individual select pins. Okay, to activate the particular chip. So data and the control were both common. All right, only the select pins were needed for individual chip selection or peripheral selection. And uh, of course, the more efficient one was the, uh, the serial data transmission. So in serial data transmission, there are two types. One is synchronous, one is asynchronous. So the main difference is the clock. Do I send the clock or do I generate my own clock? Okay, so in a uh, synchronous, synchronous uh, transmission, an explicit clock signal is sent together with the data signal. That means when the transmitter transmits, it not only transmits the data, it also transmits the clock. Okay, so the receiver will use the incoming data and the clock to sample the data and retrieve the information. Okay, so of course, 
Though this seems good, you still need two separate lines. All right, one for clock, one for data. All right, and though it works, okay, uh, it it can ex be extended to what we call a uh, full duplex communication. So what is full duplex communication? Full duplex communication basically means that I can transmit and receive at the same time because I have one line. Okay, that is for input, one line for output. So this is the input data, this is the output data. All right, so I have one particular line for output, one particular line for input, and I can uh, send and receive concurrently, okay, uh, between uh, the controller and different devices. Okay, so this is, of course, a uh, very efficient way of transmitting and receiving data. Okay, but, uh, in some cases, of course, you do not want to have two lines, okay? Or maybe you do not need to have uh, two-way communication happening concurrently. You can always do it. I send first and then I receive more like a handshake protocol. All right, so in that case, I can just simplify and use a half-duplex communication. So in half-duplex, you do not allow simultaneous send and receive but you can send and then you wait for the peripheral to respond. Okay, or the peripheral can send to you and then you wait for your response. So this of course simplifies and cuts back on one wire. So you need one wire for the data for both ways. Now, uh, even simpler mode of communication from there would be the asynchronous serial communication. So in asynchronous serial communication, you transmit only the data without the clock. And only the data without the clock. So basically, what you need to do is you need to make sure that the transmitter and receiver both have their own clock, which is already preset or pre-configured to what is agreed upon. Okay, so since there is no clock transmitter, both of them must already agree to operate at a particular rate. Then only it works. Okay, so if uh, uh, it's just like for example, when you open up your Arduino. Uh, Uno, all right, and you switch on the serial monitor, all right. Your serial monitor, you must select the baud rate, and the baud rate must match the serial print uh, or the serial monitor uh, or the uh, serial print settings that you have on your Arduino Uno code. Then it will work, all right. If not, you will just see some some very funny characters coming out, all right. So this is basically what we mean by asynchronous serial communication. Transmitter and receiver must generate the clock locally. All right, and since there is no clock coming in, you must always have what is known as a uh, start bit to tell the receiver that this is the start of a data frame. All right, so at time t equals zero, you receive a start bit, and after that, you start to uh, sample each bit that comes in. Okay, so whether it is 8 bits or 9 bits transmission, whatever is the setting that you have, and maybe you have one additional parity bit. Okay, once everything is done, you have one more stop bit. All right, so you can see that basically the whole concept is, uh, is designed such that you eliminate the clock line. So you only transmit the data, and the receiver is able to accurately uh, detect the start bit and then do its own sampling at the same clock rate to extract out the data. All right, so this is basically the overall format. Again, in this case, it's 8 bit uh, data. You can also have 9 bit data. Okay, so you have different variations to this. And the baud rate, okay, is basically uh, uh, there are a few common baud rates out there. So if you open up any serial monitor, they will have a few standard board rates, 2,400, 9,600, 40,400, and so on. So these are quite standard numbers all right, uh, that are used in many systems. So you can select one of them for the particular uh, protocol that you want. Okay, so there are also other things that to consider. When I transmit the data, is it the least significant bit goes out first or the most significant bit goes out first? Okay, and this is... Uh, sometimes configurable, okay. Sometimes it is fixed depending on how the transmitter and receiver is uh, designed. 
Okay, and then the parity bit, which we will talk about in a while. Okay, and then the stop bit. Okay, so um, in terms of the actual uh, uh, speed, okay, you, you can see that they use this term called bot, which is bot rate. Uh, again, this is quite a common, uh, I would say, confusion among uh, many people. Uh, what is bot rate? And what is bit rate? Is it the same? Is bot rate and bit rate the same? Okay, so if they're not the same, then what exactly is bot rate and what is bit rate? How do you define bot rate then? Spelling is different, okay? Valid point. Uh, but technically, what is the difference between bot rate and bit rate? Okay, so bit is, yes, directly, when you say bit rate, is is explicitly telling the bits, number of bits transmitted per second. Bot, okay, so, so I'm saying the number of characters. Okay, so, I mean, a character is, you can use the term character, but I would say that the more, uh, the, 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 the term that you probably use or we see in, in uh, textbooks or what is basically what you call the symbol rate. Okay, bot rate is also known as the symbol rate. And what is the symbol? Symbol is basically uh, uh, something that represents some information. All right. And one symbol can translate to one bit, or more than one bit. Okay, so let, let me give you an example here. Okay, if I say that I'm transmitting my data as this, okay, where the signal is between zero and one, so it's either logic one or it's logic zero. All right, so let's say this is the data I'm transmitting. Then I can say that each symbol hit up represents one bit. So one symbol here is equal to one bit. All right, so in this example where one symbol represents one bit. So if it's a high, it is one. If it is a low, it is zero. Then in this case, you can say that the bot rate is the same as the bit rate. Okay, but okay, uh, I'm not sure whether you've done any modules on encoding uh, usually in some communication module you will learn uh, encoding, signal encoding. So what is signal encoding? Signal encoding means you use a slightly different signal okay, to represent more information. Okay, So one example is if I just stick with the digital domain, all right, uh, instead of just, uh, so let's assume 0 and 1 is uh, 0 volt and 5 volt. All right, so instead of just limiting myself to 5 volt and 0 volt, what if I break it up? Okay, break it up. I say it is 0 volt, okay, 1.25, 2.5, okay, and let's say 3.5. Okay, let's just break it up into four levels here. All right, and I can say that now I can transmit signals that look like this. All right, so now what happens? I have four different uh, levels of voltages to transmit. And since I have four different levels, I can say that is two to the power of two is four. That means each symbol represents two bits. All right, so now I can say that if I receive a logic zero, this is equivalent to zero, zero. If I receive a voltage 1.25, that is zero, one. And this is? One zero and this is one one. So in this example, one symbol, okay, one symbol or one bot or one symbol is equivalent to two bits. All right. So the bot rate in this case may be the similar. Okay. So I may still say that the bot rate is, for example, one thousand. Okay, uh, symbols per second. 
Okay, but when I translate it to bit rate, it could be 2000 bits per second. Why? Because one symbol is equivalent to two bit information. All right, so this is just a simple example to, to sort of illustrate what is bot and what is bit. Okay, so the bit is the actual ones and zeros, okay, which we know. But when I transmit signal across a channel, I can always encode the signal in some uh, any other, uh, some other way, some other encoding technique. So when I encode the signal, then each signal or each symbol can represent more information, more bits of information. All right, so that is one way of increasing the throughput. Okay, you transmit more data by encoding the signal in a particular way. All right, so of course the, the more easier way is to just equate bot rate to bit rate if you are just still sticking with the standard ones and zeros. Okay. Okay, so now let's just uh, look at error detection. Okay, uh, before we, we end for today and go on to the, the user interface part. Now, error detection is uh, of course important uh, because you can never uh, sort of assume that whatever data you transmit is what you will receive. Okay, there is always a possibility that something goes wrong, especially when you are transmitting data across wires or even wireless and so on. All right, there's always a chance that things will go wrong. All right, so one side is you want to detect error. The other side is whether you can correct the error. Error correction is more, more challenging. All right, uh, you, you need more, more, deep, more other types of protocol or techniques to do it. But detecting error is, again, a bit easier, but even then it's not foolproof. Okay, so one way of doing it is what we call the parity. So what is parity is basically an additional bit that is transmitted, okay, uh, to uh, or appended to make sure that the number of ones in the whole data is either even or odd. Okay, so for example, this data over here, okay, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. So this is the data that I want to send. Okay, so I send it across. So before I send, let's assume that I select even parity. Okay, so if even parity means I want an even number of ones, all right, for my uh, whole data packet. So over here, if I count, I got one, two, three, four, five, six. So six ones, which is already even number. So the additional parity bit will be zero. Okay, so I will transmit this nine bits across the channel. Okay, now when I transmit this nine bits across the channel, okay, so this is my channel I transmit, and over at the receiver side, what I will do is I will check. So if I receive 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, and 0, okay, then I will check and see that I receive six ones. Okay, so this is at the receiver side. I receive six ones, and since I'm using even parity, all right, I assume that there is no error. All right. Now, what if one of the bits had flipped? Let's assume that maybe this bit had flipped. Okay, so one of the bits flip, and then it become five ones. So when there are five ones, so this is six ones, and then I receive five ones, so I know that something is wrong. All right, so I can detect that there is an error. But again, like I said, it's not foolproof because it cannot detect even number of errors. Okay, what if this bit flipped and another bit also flipped? Let's say this zero became a one. Then what happens? So there is actually two errors. But the overall number of one still becomes six. Okay, so I will still assume it is correct. Okay, so like I said, this parity checking is a very simple, very, very basic way of detecting some, uh, a single bit or odd number of errors. Okay, anything uh, that is even number of errors, you will, you will not be able to detect. All right, so this is not a foolproof system, but it's just a very simple way of detecting uh, uh, just a single bit or odd bit errors in your data. Okay, so, there are, of course, a lot more complicated 
uh, say more complex techniques available, uh, CRC checks and so on, to have more robust checking of error and even do some error correction. In this case, we are just doing some detection of error. You can't really correct the error, but if you want to uh, deal with it, there's only two ways. Either you discard the data or you perform some handshake protocol to ask the sender to send again. Okay, so that is basically uh, error detection. Okay, so uh, let me see. Huh? Okay, so the rest of the, the slides, which is on the software and then the, the actual register configuration, we will leave it to next week. Okay, so before we, we end, all right, uh, I just want to highlight one thing. So for the project, you are required to develop a user interface. Okay, so the user interface, okay, as you have seen from the videos and, and what you have done so far, is supposed to be an app. All right, uh, and to create an app, okay, the students in the past have all been, what I've recommended is for to use this tool called the App Inventor tool. All right, uh, I think most of you, or some of you may have already used this before, okay? So if you have, uh, you can, uh, it'll be easy for you. So I'll just put the link here. Okay, so this is the actual website. I, I've also created a set of tutorials on my own, all right, to, to, to teach you how to use this. So it's a very easy blog-based uh, tool to create apps, okay? So it's, it's very popular, okay? Uh, anybody can use it. This, this blog-based doesn't require any uh, text-based coding, okay? And it works very well for our project. Okay, and I would strongly recommend to use something like this, okay, because you don't have any uh, marks for the app, right? So do not spend a, a whole deal of time trying to create something very fancy uh, for the app, okay, because it really doesn't matter because the main thing is how well you can control the robot, all right? So as long as you create, you create a user interface where you can quite easily control the robot. I think that is what matters. Okay, I remember a few semesters ago, one student, uh, you know, he said he used Android Studio and he created this very nice user interface with a sliding kind of a joystick and everything. You know, but his robot was crashing all over the place, all right, because he was not able to uh, effectively use that user interface and, and control the robot. Okay, so, you know, I, I think that the, the main thing is the user interface is just a means to control the robot. Okay, so uh, use whatever tools that you want, all right, but again, you must be able to use it effectively to control the robot. Okay, so you want to create buttons, you want to create some sliding uh, bar, you want to create some push buttons, uh, whatever is fine. As long as you feel that it works well, for you to control your robot, then it is good enough. Okay, so do explore this. Okay, so the, the thing about uh, this is, uh, it has been around for many years, um, and it was primarily targeted at Android phones, all right? Uh, so it works very well with Android. Uh, about, about two years back, they, they launched the iOS version. Okay, the iOS version. And so far, I've tried it as well, and it also works. The only drawback, okay, the only drawback of the iOS version is that for now, okay, uh, at least from what I know, you cannot um, package it as an app yet. For Android, you can use it as an app. That means you can build the app and you can finalize it as a standalone application that can run on your phone. All right, that means it's a final APK file. Okay, uh, for iOS, you can still use it in a sort of a debug mode. That means you still need your laptop around to be connected, then it works. All right, so ideally, if you have an um, Android phone, someone in your team has it, it's good. All right, if you, nobody in your team has an Android phone, then you want to use the iOS version, you can still use it, like I said, okay? Or you can think of some other alternative which uh, use a web-based interface, all right? And why the web? user interface also works is because basically we, uh, we are going to use the ESP32, okay, which you will be issued next week, okay, to run uh, or to host an IP address. So as long as you want to create a web app that can talk to this IP address directly, also is fine. 
Okay, how to do that? Uh, I will show you all next week. All right. So the whole idea is as long as you can create some application on your phone that can directly talk to an IP address and send commands to an IP address, then you can control your phone. I mean, control your robot. Okay, using the app is one easy way. If you don't want to use an app, you want to create a web app, okay, using some other uh, tools is also fine. The key idea is I must be able to send commands to a particular IP address. As long as you can do that, you can control your robot. Okay, so that is the thing that I want you all to think about okay, in, within your team. Whether you want to use this or you want to use anything else is fine. All right, and you can start to explore this as an option. Okay, so next week, basically what we will do, um, this week you're going to be doing the PWM. Next week, you're going to be uh, 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 integrating everything together. That means the zero interface with the app and uh, everything put together. So I will demonstrate that next week. Okay, for, for this week's lab, if you are already uh, can see the waveform and everything generated and everything is good, then what I would recommend you is to go ahead to solder up your motor driver chips and connect up your motors to, to see that they are able to speed. Okay, um, I mean, time flies very fast, all right? Uh, so the faster you get your hardware up and running, I think the easier and the less stressful it will be uh, later on. Okay, so if you have time, this, this Friday itself, you can start to solder up your motor driver chips, okay, connect them up, Put in the battery pack and then try to run the use the PWM to run the motors. All right, and then from there you can start to put things together. Okay, so uh, I think that's all I have for this week. If you have any questions you want to ask, you can ask me. Uh, if not, uh, yeah, I'll see you on Friday for the lab. Ask you about the question from last week. Yeah. Three like still not quite clear about the last week's map. Do you use a copy of me? Sorry again? Last week. Yeah, like copy of last week's map. The code for last week's map. Okay, so you are not sure about the last week's lab code, is it? Yeah, correct. Uh okay, wait uh. Okay, let me open up. Yeah, so basically, uh, last week's code. Um, yeah, so the init function. I don't understand the masking one, the masking part. No, no, which, yeah, yeah, maybe this part. Let me switch one. Okay, so basically, okay, this first one here is to enable the clock. Okay, for okay. part D. Then uh, this PCR register is basically a register to configure the multiplexing, correct, which is what we used for before. All right. At the same time, you also can configure the interrupt trigger mode. All right. So this IRQC, uh, if you look back at your it's in the, the left TEF, right? Okay, so the IRQC register, I mean IRQC bits, uh, you can see here that it maps to the interrupt that you want to capture. So in this case, for example, 1010 is A, which means I want to capture interrupt on falling edge. Mm. So that is what we are doing here. 
Okay, this pull pull enable is because of the the way the switch is con configured. Okay, since we do not have any external resistor connected to the switch, we use the internal uh, pull up. Okay. Okay, so this is basically to configure the switch such that when the switch is pressed, okay, I will be able to um, detect and generate an interrupt because it's interrupt on the falling edge. Hmm. And this one is basically since the switch is an input, I need to configure it as a input by clearing the DDR register bit. Okay. Uh, because if I set to one, is output zero is input, correct? So yeah, yeah. Clear it, okay. That means I end with the complement, then I clear it, so it becomes an input. Okay, and then this last part is to enable the interrupt. Okay, so when you want to enable the interrupt, you set a priority value. You clear. So these are just uh, standard ways to do it correctly. So we first set the priority. Then you clear any pending IRQ and then you enable the IRQ. So once you do this, you are telling uh, it that you want to enable the interrupt uh, for this particular uh, pin or this particular port, port D. Uh, then basically after that, uh, so basically once you do this, that means you already um, configure the switch. The, yeah. So once the switch is pressed, I will automatically come to this IRQ handler. So every time the switch is pressed, then this is where I just, in this case, I toggle this LED control to decide whether the LED blinks or doesn't blink or something like that. But, but the, the main idea is once you configure this, if you were to put a breakpoint here, okay, you should be able to capture it. Oh, so that means it will jump to the, it will jump to this port D IRQ handler, is it? Yeah. Okay, when you press the switch. Correct. That means from where it jumped, uh, that means from the MDIC clear pending IRQ, it will jump? Or... No, no, no. That means whatever it is doing at this point, because once you run the port, you are in the main loop already, correct? Right, right, yes. yes. Yeah. So, but whenever I press the switch, I will jump to the IRQ handler. Okay. Wait, let me see. Okay. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, so maybe I can show you here. Okay, so if I were to let's say build this code. The breakpoint is it set at the in count there, the in count plus plus. I mean, yeah, you can set it there also uh, if you want. Uh, but basically, okay, so if I want to put a breakpoint here. All right, so now if I run my code, okay, the LED is blinking. Right now, if I run my switch, become one, right? Okay, so when I press my switch, now you can see I come here, all right? Mm. The breakpoint is here. So if I step, the integer count increment by one, all right? The LED control toggle, okay, then let me run. So now it has gone back to the main loop. All right. Yes. So basically, it already finished the ISR and then it's gone back to the loop. So it is down here right now. So it's off at RGB. All right. So every time I run, I will toggle the LED control. All right. And then I will be able to uh, control the LED blinking on or off. Okay. Okay. Okay, then uh, my question is actually I'm not still not very sure about like heat masking, like the concept of heat masking. So how does the all equal actually works? It means the all, all equal, equal something hmm. is basically to set the bits. Right? So for example, if I say that uh, x is uh, I say zero x. 
zero 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 eight, correct? And I say that x all equals to zero x one. That means when you do an all, that means the value here, which is zero zero zero. So if I look at the binary, the last four bits will be one zero zero zero, correct? Because the one is eight, right? Eight, then yeah. it will be one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So if I do a all with a one, so it will be a all with a zero 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 one, correct? Mm. So the all basically you do the all operation. That means zero all with one is what, correct? Yeah. Zero one. So everything, everything else is the same. Yeah. So the answer would be zero x nine. But this is temporary, is it? Or is, is it permanent? If it's all equal means it is updating x. Okay, that means x gets updated in this case. Yes. And then you will stay this way throughout the whole uh, whole program. Yes. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So that means somewhere else in the code we are supposed to uh, what's that? Control the this variable x. To make it like turn on and turn off the what you call that the bits, the relevant bits. That's why we do the. I mean, code. yeah. I mean, if let's say you you are interested, this is to update. Right, this is updating X. All right, but if let's say I only interested to know whether a bit is set or not, then I can use the end operation. All right, so if I say that, uh, if uh, X end with uh, zero x one, okay. Then do something. So in this case, uh, I want to take x value, which is zero zero one zero zero zero, and do an end operation with uh, zero 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 one. Correct. Okay. So if I do an end operation, what will happen? Everything will be zero. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So in this case, this will become a false statement. So this this yes. will not this will not execute. All right, all right. Yeah. So in this case, X is not updated. I just want to check whether yeah, a particular check, bit yes. is set or not. That's all. Okay. 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 So that means the all equal is used to like update the relevant bits that we want to change like in the code. Yeah, I mean the general rule is all with one is to set and n with zero is to clear. Okay. Okay, understood, understood. Mm. Okay. Okay, okay, thank you, bro. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay, if no other questions, thank you. I'll see you all on Friday.